it's obvious that we all uh, here uh, are very interested for uh, good patient care and good fistulas. So that's, that's basically a story about how to do this. But of course, I'll tell you some things about our Gynus fistulas. And I will start with a quiz for everybody, and feel free to give me your answers. What's wrong with this photo? Any suggestions? What's wrong with this photo? Feel free to give me an answer. It's a Photoshop. So what's wrong is the uh, patient is not a regular dialysis patient, okay? She's not old, she's not, probably not diabetic, not very diseased, good veins, good arteries. This is why I did a perfect snuffbox fistula. But that's not what you usually get, yeah? You usually have a diabetic patient, calcified arteries, bad veins, multi-operated, lots of perfusions, lots of IVs. And so what do you do next? Which takes me to quiz number two. What is common in these three fistulas? What do they have in common, these three fistulas? <coughs> Their common factor is brachial artery inflow, okay? So, in most places, also in the place where I was a resident, when a distal fistula was not possible, then the next answer was a brachial basalic or brachiocephalic fistula, and even in the guidelines, we ignore an in-between solution, which is the proximal radial artery inflow. Okay, this is uh, a very well published uh, method by Dr. Jennings, which basically uses <coughs> uses the very close anatomy of the deep communicating vein that is almost always here next to the proximal radial artery because the deep communicating vein is connecting the superficial system with the radial vein, so it's almost so it's almost always there. And basically, you have the vein just next to the artery. You don't have to mobilize it. You just have to do an anastomosis right there. And you take advantage of the larger vein, the larger artery, healthier artery, because the, pro the radial artery starts being calcified after the first few centimeters of the radial artery. So you have a very good in, good in between solution with a healthier artery, better vein, but it's still not a brachial artery fistula. <coughs> so basically, when you are, uh, let's say, uh, uh, vascular access experts, what you want to be offered, uh, offering to your patients is the best possible fistula with the least possible interventions. Because uh, let's say you do a distal fistula, but then it has to have four or five interventions and be ready to use after a year while the patient is already dialyzed with a catheter. I don't call this a success. And sometimes we vascular surgeons, we do a distal seminal fistula, for example, we feel a thrill, we consider our job is done, and we have no clue what's happening later. <coughs> So this is uh, an ultrasound imaging of the exact anatomy that you have in all these patients, and this is actually a very good example for a precutaneous fistula, where you have the brachial artery here, the proximal radial artery here, and the deep communicating going down to meet the radial artery. Very beautiful illustration, so they're exactly uh, side by side. So in this context, the ellipsis vascular access system is using this anatomy to create in the same way brachycutaneous fistula and basically what you're doing, as I will show you later in the video, you will puncture the superficial vein here at the elbow, go down the perforator with the needle, then puncture through the needle the proximal radial artery, introduce the system with the jaws in an open position, the jaw is here in the artery, here is in the vein, then you will close it, activate it, Within the jaws, it will heat very fast, and it will ablate the tissue in between, and then it will create a fusion with fusion and anastomosis between the DCV and the proximal radial artery. And this is how it looks in ultrasound imaging, elliptical shape, because this is the uh, shape of the device that is defining the shape of the anastomosis. So that's a video I'm going to show you from a live case we did for Cena meeting. So uh, you will see what I'm doing here, and this is what I see in my screen. So what you see here is a cephalic vein of the fistula is going to be the fistula layer to, to cannulate. And what we're doing here, we're staying in an axial view because we realize that in this way, you can really visualize the tip of the needle at the center of the vein and avoid injuring the uh, sidewall of the vein and be very precise. So you see with very little adjustments, I will go down the cephalic vein until I will see the ostium of the perforator, which is right here. And I will go slowly down 
navigate in a very, very small movements under a millimeter, down the perforator, no guide where I adjust with the needle, adjusting the position so I don't hit the wall, I stay at the center of the vein. Then I will push again, again inside the artery. Once you're in the artery, you, you can feel that they've run through the wall and you also see the position of the middle center of the artery. You have some arterial bleeding from the heart. You will get your wire inside, six, uh, six uh, frames of slender shift will go in and then the ellipsis device will go in. On the ultrasound, you are visualizing the crossing point, which is the point that the shift will meet the proximal radial artery. The device will be positioned in, the distal jaw will be in the artery, the proximal jaw will be in the vein. The shift will go back. The resident will pull back the shift here up to this small white spot that is securing you from pulling you the shift, pulling the shift two way back. So then the device will be closed, capturing the arterial of the venous wall. You see here I'm pulling and I feel the resistance, which means I'm, I'm in a good position. I'm pulling the artery, so this means I'm in a good position. I can see it and feel it. Then closing the jaws of the device will capture, closing slowly the jaws of the device will capture the arterial of the venous wall. The generator will show us an indication of the thickness of the tissue we have. Then uh, activating the generator will uh, uh, create the anastomosis. You see the microbiome bubbles here from the um, uh, heating and uh, taking the device out, then we decided to put a balloon in and do an immediate maturation because we realize that having a small uh, four by two anastomosis will probably delay the maturation. So we do an immediate maturation with a five by two balloon. You see some wasting here. You can inflate in nominal pressure or even higher about 30 atmosphere will give you 5.5 degree <coughs> anastomosis. Then the balloon will go off and you will see uh, a very beautiful system of diastolic flow with an excellent flow here and calculating flows uh, can give you, uh, in most cases, anything from 300 up to a liter. I think in this case, uh, you will see here, it's about uh, 500 or something. So this is how it looks four days after creation. It's, I think we would most agree that you don't have more injury than having labs. And so this is your hemodynamics. This is the anastomosis and you of course had flow into the basilic vein and into the cephalic vein because we didn't like it any branches. And this is against what we all uh, are getting told how to do fistulas because you're supposed to ligate one branch to prioritize flow and maturation in the other branch, and this is quite different. So let's talk about side branch ligation and why we don't do it. These are distally created, of course, few or many years back, uh, surgical fistulas, radiocephalic fistulas, yes. and let's see what's happening. In all these fistulas, you will see the first part of the fistula that you have only one vein draining that is pressurized, sometimes aneurysmal, or most of the time a bit aneurysmal, a bit pulsatile, because there is only one vein taking all the flow. But after this spot, you will have a beautiful cephalic, beautiful basilic, also here is a perforator, so you will have flow going down the brachial vein. So you have three systems draining the vein, and they all get mature, and they are all usable, and you can stick them without any problems without any aneurysms, without any bleeding issues after dialysis. And essentially what we're doing with this percutaneous technique, we're creating the anastomosis exactly at this point. <coughs> so basically having multiple draining branches will give you a moderate flow, low pressure fistula, and most likely what we want to see and what we want to be able to prove, less issues in the future. How about cannulating these fistulas? So, depending on the anatomy, if the patient has ma uh, mainly a cephalic vein, it will be almost the same thing as with a surgical fistula. You will cannulate the cephalic vein that is here visible <coughs> and very superficial, but not all pa patients are the same. Some patients may have a bit of cephalic vein up here, then occluded or some branches coming out, and a basilic vein here. So, we thought that in these patients, <coughs> Instead of superficializing the basilic vein, you can stick 
one plastic anion in the cephalic vein, one plastic anion in the basilic vein, use ultrasound if needed, and dilate the patient without further interventions. And as you see, this is how we're marking patients in clinics so they can stick the fistulas. And this is what we did in many patients. And in this way, we were able to avoid superficialization with plastic annulus at the elbow. Using this location also allowed us to do either cannulation. These veins that are not being dissected as we do in open surgery are usually quite wide and quite superficial even in obese patients. So we thought that if you can put a sheath and do the creation of the fistula and you take it out and nothing happens, why don't put a plastic annular in some patients if you need it, you, the flow is already there, and dialyze the patient, and we did it, and it seems that it's possible in about 10% of the patients. For example, this patient that came from Guyana to have uh, catheter placement and fistula creation, when we saw her vein, we said to the nephrologist, we just do the percutaneous fistula, we stuck the fistula day four, and the patient took the airplane and went back to Guyana seven days after creation, things uh, we would never imagine with a surgical fistula, not only about cannulation, but also for potential wound complications, yes? This patient, <coughs> 85 year old patient, we did his fistula creation. He had a cephalic vein here, some branches, cephalic vein, uh, thank you very much. I feel like a politician. <laughs> So he had the cephalic vein here, uh, spreading to some branches and giving the cephalic vein up there. He was 85 years old. I lost him. I didn't see him for several months. I said, he's probably dead or somebody operated on him. I didn't know what happened. So one year later, he comes. I'm happy to see I lost some weight. And I'm happy to see that the patient is doing great and he's getting cannulation, arterial cannula here in the cephalic vein, venous cannula here. No issues, no interventions. Is it a big deal? Perhaps for us, no. I'm sure that for this patient, it is a big deal. <coughs> we also went forward and we did some distal uh, fistulas, uh, percutaneous seminus, because it's not that common, but basically you have perforators everywhere. And while looking with the ultrasound, we saw that we had some perforators, smaller, more difficult to see, but we realized that we could do it uh, in a distal forearm, and we did four cases. And you can see one patient that had dialysis through his distal semino perfectanus created fistula. This is a day in clinics for me. Patients with cephalic vein cannulated or cephalic and basilic vein cannulated. You can see a lot of these patients are more than one year old, uh, already in dialysis, no signs of aneurysms. And I know you will say <coughs> it's not enough and you should wait more to see if you have any aneurysms. And I will show you this uh, uh, perfect snuffbox fistula, which is the same time frame, and you see that the development of a surgical fistula is not the same, it's a different animal. Now some numbers, because photos are very important, but numbers are also important. We published our early results uh, uh, for this technique, and uh, now we're having many more patients. So what's happening? Uh, until now, we almost have 200 patients. A very high technical success rate, because as you will realize if one day you do it, or even from the video, the main thing is the puncture. Once you realize how to do the puncture, which is kind of tricky, because you have to go down the vein and suddenly change the course and go into the artery. These are small vessels. I admit it's a kind of difficult technique to puncture, but after doing five or 10 cases, you can get it, and that's about it. And then it's five steps. Put the device, activate the balloon, you're done. So after the puncture, basically, you cannot screw this up. So this is why the technical success, once you get it, it's pretty high. We start getting some distant follow-up, almost a year, mean follow-up, and the cumulative patent patency is about 96%. And what we see, as I will show you shortly, is that you, we do have to do some angioplasties at the level of the anastomosis, but because I think with the heating there is some remodeling, the anastomosis is small, you get some stenosis, the anastomosis, or you may have some plug that you have to go through with the needle and balloon it again. But we didn't have any other issues. We didn't have still syndrome, we didn't have high flow, 
We had some superficializations, and that's again because you know I'm preaching about ultrasound guided cannulation, but it's unfortunately it's not doable everywhere. So for some centers that I know they will have issues to cannulate them, I will try to make them more similar to a surgical fistula because these percutaneous fistulas, given the multiple draining veins, they have lower pressure. The average maturation time is quite satisfactory, and the, uh, as I said, the early cannulation was possible about 10% of the cases. Very, very important difference from a surgical fistula. We have 0% declots, 0% declots, and 0% draining veins stenosis PTA. And I think these are major differences, and let me explain why I think we have these differences. So the declots. When you have a surgical fistula, you have one vein connected to the artery, we ligate all the side branches, and this vein will get overflow. And when you have occlusion of the anastomosis, the vein will get occluded from the anastomosis until the first branch coming in that will maintain the flow. The percutaneous fistula, you don't ligate any side branches. So if you have occlusion of the anastomosis, the side branches are coming in almost immediately and they maintain flow. So you have no clot in the vein. So in these cases that I had occlusion of the anastomosis, we just needed to go through with a wire and it'll just balloon it and you're up and running again which is protecting the fistula from all the inflammation of the thrombosis of the vein of the water tenor. About the draining vein stenosis, I think the difference is that when you have a surgical fistula and you take a vein that was transferring before 10, 20 milliliters per minute, and now you say you shut up, you will transfer one liter per minute, day and night, all the time, the vein doesn't like it. It starts creating stenosis. At an anatomical spot that you have some compression from you know, the, the thoracic outlet or something, you, it cannot just accumulate all this flow and it cannot accommodate all this flow and you have to balloon it and what we do is balloon it over and over again and stand in and we induce more trauma and this is just non-stop. With these fistulas, you have moderate flow, it's going through multiple branches, the pressure is low and if you find the right balance and they can cannulate and do dialysis, that's all you need to do and I think this is definitely a major difference. And sometimes they say that we may be cherry picking our patients to do percutaneous fistula. So what about this patient who had multiple uh, occluded failed fistulas on the left side, multiple fistulas on the right side, stenotomy, catheters everywhere, occlusion of central veins. The only thing that you cannot see is this beautiful percutaneous fistula that she has for the last year and she's having dialysis. So, in conclusion, uh, I think we all agree, uh, or we could try to agree, uh, that this is a very interesting technique, uh, very high uh, patient nephrology satisfaction, efficient, with lots of advantages. I don't think it's a future. I think it's a, a revolution, and I invite you all to get into the bus because before it's too late. <laughs> Uh, if you're interested in all that, on September 13, we're doing a meeting in Paris with Dr. Jennings and Dr. Borkelo. We'll have live cases and all other interesting stuff or innovations, and you're all invited. Thank you very much.